I'm honored to be here, and I, I really wanted to say how special Decoding Dyslexia is as an organization. Um, there are a handful of organizations out there that are leading uh, the next phase of dyslexia, and they're talking about a movement, and they're talking about uh, bringing together the energy and frustration that people feel and turning it into positive change for them in, as individuals but also for their children and ultimately for people beyond them because that's really the opportunity that is dyslexia. Um, I want to thank the organizers very much, Diana. Thank you for, for, for that really lovely introduction. Um, I know in part it happened because I was with many of the leaders of Decoding Dyslexia in New Orleans about 10 days ago or so, and I know things that they did there that I'm not supposed to tell you about. Um, so the stories about the police, I will not bring those up. Don't worry. Uh, and uh, uh, guarantee yourself a good introduction that way. Um, and with that, I'd really like to just jump into it. I will apologize in advance by saying my voice is a little soft. I've been um, uh, <laughs> hanging out with a, a dear friend here and his young children, and uh, it's been, um, I'm sick. So uh, <laughs> keep, keep your distance. I, I should start by highlighting Headstrong Nation, which is the organization that I am a founder of, the founder of. Headstrong Nation is a 501c3 not-for-profit that was started in 2003. Our, our principle at that time was to record the stories of the dyslexia community so that we could preserve them and save people the frustration of learning all the lessons that we've already learned. We've expanded our mission since then. Um, we now have a website that has wonderful free information for parents uh, and for students and for adults who are dyslexic. And that's really ultimately our wheelhouse. Our wheelhouse is the adult community of people who are dyslexic. Now, I know that dyslexia is in this room because there's lots of kids and it doesn't come from the water. So um, <laughs> there's going to be a genetic pool somewhere out there that draws on this. Uh, I also want to tell you that um, we are really motivated to work in the long term with decoding dyslexia. I think it's incredibly important for people who are in this experience to be at the forefront and have a seat at the table. If you look at the area of other disability profiles, like say deafness, you would not do research in the world of deafness without asking the deaf whether you're doing it right. The same thing should be true in the case of dyslexia. People who are dyslexic and parents who I consider to be inside that club, they are also homeowners. They are doing this struggle every day, dealing with a system that may not have been set up well in the first place. There are critical allies around that. I think teachers are instrumental. I have never met a teacher who doesn't believe that all children can learn and is not dedicated to helping them. I have met some administrators who are not, um, in, not, do not believe that principle, but I would also say that even administrators, and in fact most administrators, are on board as soon as you give them the real story. And they're dealing with really substantial pressures on them from outside the world. Our job is to help them see the light and to educate them and support them, and if not, to apply some pressure and eventually sue them into oblivion. <laughs> This so, is a, um, an fMRI. It is a functional magnetic resonance image of the human brain while reading. On uh, the left side is um, a demonstration of someone, the temporoparietal lobe. If you place your finger on your, on your temple, you will um, experience the inside of, the, of your brain right there is where the decoding process of reading happens. Decoding and reading are a really bizarre skill that we've picked as a way to express the process of learning. If you go back in time, it's only about 5,000 years that we've actually had written text as a way to learn. And it's only within the last 100 years, maybe even within the last 50, that we've had any expectation in the, in the limited first world that the majority of people would be able to do this thing. Yet today, we take it as like physics that everyone should read. And it's a recent invention that we have, have manufactured. If you go back in time, Socrates was actually against reading. He was against print. Uh, Socrates, a fairly bright guy, by most modern standards, was illiterate. He did not read, and he did not expect people to read. In fact, he preferred that they engage in dialogue. He didn't want them sending emails and putting things up on Twitter. He wanted them talking to other people about their thoughts. Um, we probably could use a little bit of that wisdom these days. Um, I will note that Plato did write it down. So it wasn't everybody at that time. And we only have his thoughts preserved because it was a, a useful way to record knowledge. But just question that fundamental paradigm as we go through this presentation. So that's the person on the left. On the right, it's not Socrates. This is actually me. This is literally my brain. 
this was a study that was done at Stanford in, uh, in 2003. They wanted to look at the brains of dyslexic adults. They looked at kids and they'd seen that there was this pattern. Um, what the color indicates is the level of oxygen in the blood that's being drawn to that region. Your brain actually directs oxygen towards active parts of the brain. Less active parts get less oxygen, so it's a very efficient system. You'll notice that I'm not drawing a lot of oxygen to the reading center in the brain during my MRI. Now, a little backstory on this story. When I was first um, identified as a young kid, I was picked up in second grade. They brought my mother in. They put a box of tissue on the table, my father in. They, they sat them down, it's all serious, and said, we, we do believe your child may be dyslexic. And they sort of said it under their breath, right? And the reason they said that was because they knew that there was a stigma associated with this word, even when I was a young child. This was before um, it was as widely identified as possible. And I sat in a unique position in that era which is that I was among the first to be identified because of a change in the law. The law now says that schools must identify. Now, they don't always do that, but they have a legal obligation under uh, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act, something called child find, to find us. And sometimes they don't do it. Sometimes they won't use the word dyslexia because they don't want you to figure out that you could ask them to do that. Um, and when I say they, I mean the, the bureaucracy. Um, bureaucracies by default, I find to be fairly lazy organizations. That's kind of the point of bureaucracy, is to make things easier, in theory. You should be able to routinize and make it simple. But it turns out that that works against you if you are unconventional. The way I like to think of it is this. In the world of computing, for many years, we had Windows, and then we had Mac. About 80% of computers were Windows, and about 20% were Mac. So as I see it, mainstream readers, Windows, Dyslexics, Max, right? It's a good, it's a good, it works out well for us, right? Until we'll see how the business plan for Apple does now that he's not at the helm. But a uh, critical point here, when I saw this image, I was actually thrilled. And I'll tell you how it went down. I went into that meeting very nervous. I was concerned that I would come back not dyslexic. I'd just done all my testing. Here I was at Stanford Law School and Business School getting all these fancy credentials. And I was getting a lot of accommodations. And it occurred to me, if I was a person in a wheelchair and I'd been using the ramp, if it turned out I wasn't a person in the wheelchair, would they think less of me for never having gone in through the stairs? Would I, in fact, be cheating and taking resources that weren't mine? And this, this underscores a major issue in the world of dyslexia, which is its non-obviousness. Now, I won't say invisibility. Because when you're an expert and when you know what to look for, you can tell the signs right away. Cross-laterality, being left-handed or right-handed, there'd be other factors that they could pick up as a predisposition towards that. But when you're non-obvious, you don't have proof. If I have a wheelchair, it's really hard for someone to be like, you could go up the stairs. Go on. You're like, I'm in a wheelchair. Do you see this, right? In the context of dyslexia, someone say, you can read it. If you tried harder, you could read it. No, I can't. And, and that's a flaw in the reading, it's not a flaw, it's a flaw in the book, it's a flaw in the stairs, it's not a flaw in the person in the wheelchair, right? So when I got these images, I went in there thinking, my God, they could just blow apart my identity. You know, here I am, they could say, sorry, not dyslexic, disqualified. This is actually before the images were taken, it was based on all the, the, the written tests. And I walked in real nervous, right? And the teacher, the, the teacher, <laughs> the, the medical professional on the other side of the table in a white lab coat sat there, didn't make eye contact, and eventually, um, she said, look, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're really dyslexic. And I was like, really? That's awesome. No, go oh, great. And she told, she didn't know what to do. She was like, she was like, uh, uh, it was as though I, like, she told me I had cancer. I'm like, yeah! You know, but it wasn't cancer. It's an identified profile, right? So I am from New Hampshire. We don't diagnose me as being from New Hampshire. I'm just from New Hampshire. Right? Same way around dyslexia. I'm from dyslexia. I come from that space. And so for me, this was a moment where I was proud and excited about who I was and fearful that it would be taken from me. Because what I miss is the opportunity to connect with other dyslexics. I miss that opportunity to have a sense of community. And community comes through shared suffering and pain. That's where it starts. But it comes out to joy. Um, here is a blog that I wrote for the National Committee on Learning Disabilities, NCLD, wonderful organization, incidentally. They do, they've got a great website, really useful information, highly recommend them. Um, I chose to approach them about having the formal identification instrument in my book at the end because they've got the best science out there. Great job they do. 
So I wrote this book. Now, all the eye readers out there are furiously reading it. There won't be a quiz. Um, but I will tell you that uh, when I wrote this blog, I published it. And I said, you know, I want to make sure that I publish the raw version. Because I know when you look at me, I present as mainstream, right? You look at me, I'm wearing a suit. I went to college. I got a law degree. And everyone's like, oh, well, you're over the dyslexia. No, 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 no. I need to both simultaneously be highly competent, right? JD, MBA, Stanford and highly incompetent, can't spell JDA and BA Stanford, <laughs> right? So like those have to coexist. This is what it looks like when I try and write that today. So when your kid, do you see your kid misspelling stuff and getting frustrated over it? Let it go. Eye reading is not that big a deal. There are three types of reading. There's eye reading, there's ear reading, and there's finger reading. Finger reading is for blind people. We use Braille because they can't see. It's very obvious that they can't see, so we give them a tactile interface in order to pull this off the page. Mainstream people use eye reading because it's a great skill to have. Much like going upstairs is a great skill to have. And if your kid can do that, get them as far down that path as possible. My personal uh, plan for folks, and it's in the, the book, is Two years of Orton-Gillingham training is probably the best place to start. Orton-Gillingham is a specific methodology that was designed in the 1930s to be multi-sensory, wonderful way to do it, and it, it has many different flavors and names, uh, Wilson Learning, uh, uh, the Barton Method, there's a bunch of others that are out there, all great. Key point, though, is to stop using Orton-Gillingham after about two to three years, because it can trigger the negative side of things, shame. And I'll come back and explain shame in a moment. Let me finish what this represents. So my misspellings, my grammatical errors, my reversals and omissions, my, 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 my uneven paragraphs. When I write, when I wrote you know, a random house book, a 300 page book, I speak and my computer writes for me. It's essentially as though I'm a really rich guy in the 1940s, right? Like I have someone there just writing down everything I say in real time. Right? And then I have someone who reads it back to me, and then I can go in and speak to them and they'll change it. That's just what a laptop or, or an iPad can do today. It can just handle that function. Right? It, it doesn't get me everywhere on time, but it does handle a lot of other things quite well. This, I had my computer read it back to me, and then I tried to transcribe it without the aid of a spell checker, without the aid of a grammar checker, without the aid of all the assistive technologies that we now use. My favorite assistive technology is the spell checker, because this is a great example of where something was considered cheating and now is considered essential. When I was growing up, uh, there was a big panic. If we introduce spell checkers, no one will spell properly. Parenthetical, who cares? Close parenthetical. <laughs> it turns out that uh, a, a teacher then would be frustrated because their kid is getting to use a spell checker. Now, go to a college professor these days, and when they get a paper and it's the misspellings in it, what do they say? The kid didn't even spell check it, right? They've reversed it. They're like, you must spell check. You're lazy if you don't spell check. And that's all a construction on both sides of the equation. It's completely made up based on what is easy and available. Spell checkers are now built in, easy and available. Not all well designed for dyslexics. Anyone who's dyslexic knows that that little red line haunts you. Um, <laughs> But there's some great ones. Uh, Ginger is a wonderful piece of software recommended on our website. It's actually in a very intuitive and, and follows dyslexia. So Ginger software is a great tool. You can build it into your browser, correct your grammar. It's really funny. Um, this is the book that I wrote. It's the Dyslexia Empowerment Plan. Um, I chose the word empowerment and plan for a reason. Empowerment because I believe that ultimately this is a challenge about knowing yourself and then about telling your story, which is really a very fundamental human trait if you do it well. I mean, this is something that all people could benefit from. If you're a woman, if you're a person from France, if you're you know, a great athlete, being able to understand your strengths and your weaknesses and then tell your story is essential to living well. In the context of dyslexia, because you are a square peg being shoved into a round hole, it's important that you tell your story because they'll just keep pounding on it. And that will leave a really serious mark. So that is the first half. The other half was plan. Let's actually get some step-by-step -step steps of what you should do and, and, and some forks in the road that will happen. For example, should you tell your child that they, in fact, have been identified as dyslexic? Yes, you should. Because if you don't, the child has this, like, one, they're smart, and they can tell you're running around talking about it. Oh, he came in the room. Don't say it again, right? Or 
they find out later and they feel like you lied to them for many years. One of my favorite stories about this book was um, a woman who I was dating at the time. Um, uh, she, uh, she read the book and goes, oh my gosh, I'm dyslexic. And I was like, well, did you ever talk to your parents about it? She was like, yeah, but they never identified me. She went and spoke with them. And they're like, oh yeah, 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 we had you identified, third grade. But we didn't want you to feel shame, so we didn't tell you. And she's like, um, most of my life I've been walking around thinking I was stupid and lazy, thanks a lot. <laughs> it then did something interesting, which is it opened up many other doors in the family. Because it's in the gene pool, it was then an uncle, it was then a grandfather, it was then the cousin who's really having a hard time in school. And suddenly these stories started coming out of the closet. Important as you begin to unpack these stories, go slowly. This stuff is real. People's psychological health is rooted in this conversation. And if you force your kid to suddenly be public about it, they will not appreciate this. You want to move carefully and slowly and move with advocacy. Help the person see other people do it well. Right? They see me talking about it, and it's a little less scary. If they see a student, like say these amazing students who are part of Decoding Dyslexia, those kids are putting themselves out there, and it's a serious risk for them to do that. But they're also going to be much better off for having done so, because they'll be happier and bolder. Um, I'll throw up one more thing, which is this star reviewed. Um, so when I, when I published a book, ironically, I become an expert in dyslexia when you publish a book. <laughs> Think about that for a second. It doesn't make a lot of sense, <laughs> but OK, uh, presuming you're dyslexic. Um, the starred review, I called my editor and they said, you got a starred review. And I was like, I got one star? And she's like, no, no, no. It's like star, not star. Star's good. I was like, oh, OK, good. <laughs> I was like, wow, I just got rotten tomatoes thrown at my book. Um, and what I learned was that I knew nothing about the publishing world. And I had a great team at Random House that really helped me explain it. And also, I had editors and other people, which is part of why I show that raw text. Because it also, in addition to my cleanup of it, which got it to about 95% accuracy, then there's a team of like seven people sitting behind them who proof it and everything else. So we'll continue on. A um, Couple other things. Um, when I talk about this, um, I think it's a good place to introduce the concept of shame. And then I want to talk about what this image is. Um, Shame is the central issue in dyslexia. It is the most important thing. It is the issue that will drive the success for everyone involved in the situation. If you can identify shame and deal with it, then you will get out of jail, essentially. Let me give you the parable of shame. And this comes from a clinical psychologist named Gershon Kaufman, who is a brilliant scientist. He has written uh, the definitive work on both shame and then a bunch of other uh, psychological topics. This is the parable. A child wants to make a rocket. That rocket is uh, you know, going to be the model rocket that blows up and you know, goes up in the air. He goes to his father and he says, Dad, I really want to make this rocket. Would you help me? His father, who's home working that day, turns to his son and says, leave me alone. I told you not to come into my office when I'm on the phone. And the kid, like, you know, he just got bitten very badly by his father, who was just stressed from work. He wasn't angry about what the child was asking. He was angry that he was interrupted. And probably he was angry about something else that was transferred into that situation. But he reacts harshly. Child pulls back, goes back to his room, cries a little bit, quiet. The next day, father thinks about it. He says, boy, I really screwed that up. And he goes to find his son. And when he opens the door and says, son, did you want to make a rocket? The son will instantly react. No, I didn't want to make a rocket. And why would you even ask that? Because he has internalized that a person he respects believes rocket making is a negative thing to do. He has attributed his own behavior to what happened. He said, that's what it must have come from. And, and father has a choice at this moment. He can either double down on shame, or he can break the cycle. The double down on shame path is, you need to learn to respect your elders and don't ever yell at me. Don't ever raise your voice. I'm closing this door and you can't come out until you come downstairs and apologize. And that just confirmed for the kid. As soon as the door closed, he's like, yep, check. Rocket making bad. Dad angry every time it comes up. Not going near it. Or father can say, I'm really sorry that I reacted that way. I apologize. It's my fault. I love you deeply. And I really would like to work with you on this. Can you tell me about the rocket? If this is the f not the first time this happened, the child will come back and say, go away. I don't want you in my room. You're not allowed in my room. And we'll continue to use anger to cover fear, which is ultimately shame. Shame is the experience of being thought unworthy by yourself. 
Very important to understand this. There is no one who can enforce shame on you other than you. You are doing this. You feel like it's someone else. Look at the way, um, take gay marriage in, in, in many states. If someone's against gay marriage, people who are gay can be for gay marriage, right? It doesn't have, you don't have to, and they don't have to feel shame over that, right? The civil rights activists who in uh, the 1960s went into lunch counters and sat down, they were hurled shame messages, dogs biting them, people with fire hoses, people locking them up, people blowing up their homes because this was so inappropriate what they were doing. But yet they internalized, no, I'm doing something that is noble and honorable. The flip side of that is I myself had many times when I, before I was public about my dyslexia, pulled back from something for fear that I would be judged. And that was me internally uh, enforcing that. And so you have to find it and address it. And the way to address it is through love and support and conversation and facts. Um, another key piece is modeling showing people examples of someone who is able to be easy about it. When you watch an interview with Richard Branson talking about dyslexia, it's very powerful. Richard Branson started Virgin, he's dyslexic, shame-free about it. Now one of the things about Richard Branson is shame-free about a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> but that's Richard Branson, right? I will say, however, it's important also to find local role models. If you want your kid to be happier about themselves when they're dyslexic, get them to hang out with these kids. Right? Let me show you an image of a kid who is not feeling shame about dyslexia. You see this young man? Does that say shame? Does that say don't look at me? Does that say I'm, I'm broken? No, he's thrilled. And he's excited and he's got a beautifully designed card that you can buy outside, I'm assuming, for the holidays. So think about that. Um, so let me go back then to this image. This image is used to define intelligence. It's part of the WACE, which is the uh, Wechsler Adult Scaled Intelligence Test. It's a standard testing instrument that's used when you, do dis when you identify dyslexia. And when I say dyslexia, I should be clear. I mean dyscalculia, dyspraxia, um, you know, uh, dysgraphia, uh, ADHD, anything where the kid is going to be sent away from a mainstream classroom for a non-obvious learning-related issue. I would note, it's not actually learning that's the problem. I don't have a learning disability. I learn very well. I have a reading disability, and I have a spelling disability, and I have great difficulty with grammar. So I have disabilities in these targeted areas, but the overall category of learning is not a problem because reading with your eyes and learning are two different activities, it turns out, but we conflate them, and that's a real challenge. Back to this test. The test goes like this. Which of these three objects will create the object on the top? Go, right? Quickly, people who love these types of tests are like, oh, well, that's easy. It's six, one, and two. Boom, boom, boom. Done. Next one. Now, me, looking at that, when I first saw it, I thought, well, they didn't tell you whether you could stack. Because this is not three-dimensional, right? This is, this is just one way of looking at it. So if we're looking at it from above, it doesn't give me any angles on either side, and it's not in the instructions. So I could have used four, one, and two. It could just be laid on that way, right? Or I could have used one, uh, I could have used one, uh, six, and, uh, let's see, uh, one, six, and four. Or, like, I can do, do multi-layers, right? Which the test takers will mark you down for being less intelligent, right? <laughs> Think that through for a second. Um, that is inherent to identifying and measuring intelligence. Because the thing you need to ask about intelligence is, in what context is he intelligence? You want to mess with someone? They're like, he's really smart. Ask them, in what context is he really smart? Right? Because the guy who gets uh, like, you know, perfect grades on his SAT may lose his wallet every day. Right? Like, not smart about wallets, very smart about SATs. Right? <laughs> Turns out that's an important skill is holding on to your wallet. But no one is testing that to get into college, which is kind of stupid because if you lose your wallet every day in college, you're probably not going to have a good college experience. Just saying. When, um, when someone is dyslexic, uh, we have a habit of, um, of telling it like it's bad news. The box of tissue on the table, right? It's just a characteristic, you know? I have news for you. Your child's a girl. Okay. Not, I, I need to let you know this. Your child is not a boy. Like, it's not going to go well, right? Like, think about that. that and it's, it's the equivalent in terms of the immutable characteristic that is endemic to their personality and who they are. Now. In the context of this, let me, let me back up. Um, 
Uh, would someone be willing to tell me what was your first car? The first car you drove, and there'll be a prize given, which is the person who has the worst car is going to, is going to win this. So who, who can tell me about the first car they drove? Yes? A Honda Accord, but was it like a, a beater? Stick shift. Stick shift? All manual. <laughs> All manual. All right, yes. A VW bus. A VW bus. Anybody else? Yes. A Chevy Vega. A Chevy Vega. One more, one more. Yes. A Studebaker. Wow. Was it a used Studebaker? We have a winner. I'm sorry. When your car is no longer a production model, you just won the game. So um, now. Think about your own, your own children for a moment. Um, who has a child who's in their late teens right now? Do they have a car yet? No. If you, if you were to get them a car, what kind of car would you get them? A Jeep? Used and cheap. Used and cheap, which would be what? Um, Top of mind. Pick a brand. A Honda. A Honda. <laughs> Buyers and sellers here, ladies and gentlemen. We can work it out. Another, another pick. Another, another, another person for their kid. Yes. A Toyota 4Runner. Okay, one more, one more. Yes? I have a 16-year-old. I got her a Hyundai Elantra. A Hyundai Elantra. Okay, great. Now, what unifies all six cars we just heard about? They all got four wheels. Yes, what else? Japanese. What else? Some Japanese. Some Japanese. Studebaker, not so much. Uh-huh. What else? Think deeper. Combustion engines. Every one of those cars has a combustion engine and it uses gas. But that's not the only kind of car you can have. You can have an electric car. I've been doing this exercise with audiences for the last you know, three months or so. I probably had 150 people. One person said electric in the entire, the entire exercise because we are programmed to think of cars as oil burning. But they don't have to be. We are programmed, heads up metaphor, to think about reading as the way to learn. But you don't have to. There's other ways to get around. There's other ways to learn. So let me give you an example of when you go in and someone puts the box of tissue in front of you and says, I have news for you. Your child is getting an electric car, right? Because electric car, you think of something like this. 2010 is the year of the electric car. We're waiting on the Nissan Leaf. We're waiting on the Chevy Volt. I have the currently existing club car, street legal golf cart. And what I'm going to be doing with this is taking it out to the nearest public charging station to the Los Angeles Times, which happens to be at the Santa Monica Pier. All right, hands up. Who's ready to trade in their car for this vehicle? All right, yeah, no hands. OK. Now, let me give you a different model of what a car looks like. This is a Tesla. Anyone ever heard of a Tesla? Yeah, yeah not, not, the, not the inventor, but the car. My favorite story about a Tesla is a friend of mine who bought one recently, business partner of mine, and he takes it down to the store, the hardware store, where he's going to be loading bags of concrete in the back of this thing. And the guy was like, why, why would you do that? He goes, well, it's got a plastic lined bed, and it's got dynamic shock. So as I put more bags in, the car levels up, and my pickup truck just sinks to the ground. Right? So the car is actually better for it. And the guy's like, do you think you can haul as much concrete? He goes, we'll find out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Dyslexic. Um, the guy says to him, well, who makes it? And he goes, Tesla. He goes, yeah, yeah, but who makes Tesla? And he goes, Tesla. Because right? he wanted like Ford, you know, because we're all programmed to know what that is based on what people tell us. So the Tesla, incidentally, Consumer Reports has only once in its history given a 100% rating to a car. They gave it to this car. Safest car on the road. Why? No engine block. Nothing to crash through you in the front of the car when you slam into somebody. It's, it's crumple zone all the way around. Now, it does cost $100,000. <laughs> but I will tell you, the next version that they're going to bring out is an SUV that's going to cost about 50. And after that, they're doing a family sedan that costs about 25. Minivan, and I don't know. Talk to, talk to Elon Musk. So uh, here, then, is, is, the, is the car. Model S and the BMW M5. Now, a lot of the discussion about the Tesla is centered on its range, its price, and whether Tesla has a business case or not. We're here to answer one. I hit the space bar there, sorry. Very simple question. Can it outdrag an M5?
Tesla Model S, the thing that people are most probably concerned about is the 300 miles of range. But guess what? 443 pound-feet of torque at zero RPM, it's quicker than an M5, zero to 100 miles an hour. That's a cool car. Now, if you went up to your electric car kid and said, where's the gas cap, and tried to put gas in it, you're going to say, my kid's broken. But if you go up and say, where's the charging station, and can it out drag race a BMW, the answer is yes. But you have to give it the right inputs. You have to give it the right support. You have to you know, focus on that shame issue first, and then get it access to learning in a way that'll make it powerful. So you end up with people like Magic Johnson, or people like the woman who just won the Nobel Prize in uh, medicine 2009, a woman named Carol Grindeter. Uh, she cannot spell the word telomerase, but she discovered them and actually figured out how to trace them in DNA uh, sequencing. Amazing, amazing skill. If you can play to the strengths, things will work out a lot better. Let's keep moving. Um, I want to show you briefly the Headstrong website. Uh, this is the homepage for the Headstrong website. And you know, we emphasized at the, at, the, uh, at the outset that dyslexia is not a disease. It's a community. We're part of something together. And that's what you are. You're part of something together. Um, this is a group of adults who are dyslexic. We have this uh, event every year. Most conferences, uh, they, they want to put you in the basement of Marriott. We go for a wine tasting tour, right? It's a great way to get to know each other, um, including we have some you know, people who are alcoholics who don't drink, but they're there to hang out. Um, there's a parenting section. Uh, look at that. I did not plan that in any way, but there are the decoding dyslexia people right there. Um, and it also has tools. Um, this will demonstrate how to turn your kid into an electric car who is going really fast. So for example, there's videos on saving time with speech, demonstrating it. Important thing, when you start using technology, you need to learn how to explain to people why you're using technology. So that's an important skill as well. Keep in mind that learning how to use these technologies, a computer you can read from or have read to you, that is not an innate skill either. It takes some time. You have to put in energy and work on it. You have to play to your kid's strengths. In the context of your kid who's dyslexic, they are not sick. They are not diagnosed with this disease. They're identified with it. It's just a characteristic. We don't diagnose your daughter as being a girl. We don't diagnose me as being from New Hampshire. And you can begin making change by changing your own language about it. Um, the problem is not with you. The problem is with the school. The problem is with the teaching method. The problem is with the book. In the context of the person who's in a wheelchair, the problem was with the architect, the problem was with the contractor, the problem was with the stairs. It is not the person in the wheelchair who's broken, it's the design around them. It's a very important fact. In addition, um, the child can go from feeling broken to feeling empowered, from feeling alone to being in a community, from being ashamed to being proud, and ultimately from feeling unworthy to feeling worthy. And that's the central thing. And the data tells us if you can get your child thinking about their own emotional health and you can support them in doing that, it's wonderful. I'll give you one critical example. Probably the single most important emotional characteristic is resiliency. Resiliency is the capacity to get up and continue when you've been knocked down. If you look at entrepreneurs, you know what they are? They're nine-time failures who on the 10th time got it. That's what entrepreneurship is. And it's why we are 35% of entrepreneurs. It's one of the factors, 35%. We're only 10% of the mainstream population as dyslexics, up to maybe 20% if you broaden it, the category to all the other specific learning disabilities that are identified. Yet we run 35% of the successful startup companies and many Fortune 500 companies. Why does that happen? Well, we learn resiliency early. You know what this path to success is? Failure. When you learn to fail, you will eventually succeed. When you bounce back and do it over and over and over and do it well. Also. Malcolm Gladwell has just published in his new book. Uh, and has anyone read David and Goliath? So I'm saying I'm in a room where more people have read my book than Malcolm Gladwell's book. I'd just like to note that for the record. <laughs> um, uh, he talks about um, it being a desirable difference or desirable difficulty, right? He's sampling on the winners on that one um, because we're also 41% of the US prison population. So we're innovators, but sometimes in the wrong business, just saying. Uh, it turns out that that statistic is incredibly important because when you think about the movement that you're creating, it's not just about your kid or about your school. It's about people who are disenfranchised. I will, I will name it bluntly. If you look around this room, this is a fairly white room. There are some people of color in here, but not as many as there should be given the statistical distribution of dyslexia, which is 10% or, or so across every population. And that's a function of who gets access to the information and resources to fight this battle. 
And once we succeed at fighting this battle, we need to widen the pool of people who are getting access to it. You can also do this. You can change your own language. You can talk about, instead of talking about people being diagnosed, they are identified. Instead of people being remediated, you can train them. Instead of overcoming this, you can integrate it. The problem is not reading, it is eye reading, ear reading, finger reading. One of my favorite stories I heard recently was a girl whose mother had read the book and then she'd listened to the audio of it. And they're sitting at some event and the younger brother's, the younger brother's sports match, it's like the six year olds, right? And the person sitting to her left, apparent with great fanfare says, wow, my child is an excellent reader. They're just reading everything in sight. And she looks and goes, is that eye reading or ear reading? No. And the woman was like, what, what do you mean? She's like, well, there's two types, of, actually three types of reading. And she just, like, the, the, the nine-year-old just laid it out for her. And the woman was like, like, she'd just been knocked off her pedestal by a nine-year-old who understood what, lead, what learning should actually be. I thought it was brilliant. Love that story. Um, a critical thing about uh, the book is the law. It's very important that you learn to understand the law. Unfortunately, people will not always work with you on your terms. Um, the law functions best when it's a bodyguard. These are bodyguards. A good bodyguard stands off in the back of the room with an earpiece on and sunglasses and looks really scary, but doesn't do a whole lot. You don't want to go guns in a blazing to sue your school. You don't want to, you know, because it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's risky, and time is of the essence. You have a child who is going through day after day of slow drip trauma if they're in a school system that is not supporting them. Let me tell you what that ultimately can look like. I went through that system. My parents were dialed in. They did a great job. They were really on that task. But even then, I did harm to myself. When I was 15 years old, I desperately wanted to make the varsity soccer team, which was, incidentally, a totally outsized goal for a 15-year-old. I was a sophomore, and I was you know, not big enough, not strong enough. I came close, but then I didn't make the team because I made a stupid mistake. That day, I broke my own hand. Now, why would I do that? I broke my own hand. You can come up and see the bone as we're signing it, signing books, because I didn't want anyone to find out that I was a failure. And if I'd broken my hand on the day that I didn't make varsity, well, that's everything people would remember. So I was creating a narrative that I knew publicly. I was using my social skills and my narrative skills to mask my personal experience. I will tell you that when I did research on the Intel Reader and in the populations that I talk to today, the incidence of cutting of anorexia, of inappropriate drug and alcohol use by young people is much higher in this population. And if you think about the research we're doing right now, we can stop researching children's ability to decode. We know enough about it. We figured it out about 30 years ago. We could begin focusing on their emotional health. That is a place to put resources and energy. Because if we can establish that the suicide rate among dyslexic kids or the attempted suicide rate among dyslexic kids is much higher, that will hopefully begin to change the conversation about what we should be doing for our children. So think about that when you think about it. And I want to stress to you, by being here, you are getting ahead of that game. One thing I always say to parents when they come to me is they, they often carry their own fear and shame. They should have spotted it earlier. They haven't done enough. Maybe. But I'll tell you, you need to do your own house cleaning. You need to get over your own anxiety and your own fear about what happened and focus on your child's future. That's where the energy needs to go. Spend some time with a shrink, talk it out with your friends, go get a couple beers. However you're gonna do it, you go do it. But make sure that you're present for that kid's future because that's the most important piece of it. So these are organizations that I think are outstanding. Obviously, Decoding Dyslexia in every state they're working on are doing a great job. Um, Learning Ally and Bookshare are wonderful organizations. Learning Ally is a, um, an organization that has been around for over 60 years. It used to be Recording for the Blind and then Recording for the Blind Dyslexic. They have over 80,000 titles. Um, full disclosure, I do consulting for them right now, so I have a relationship with them. But I will tell you, they also have a new service which you should look into. Um, they have an 800 number that any parent can call and get free consultation from expert parents who are dyslexic, many of them founders of Decoding Dyslexia in their own state. It's an incredibly good resource. Bookshare, free services available, free audiobooks. Um, you can get them uh, your, it, when your school says it's expensive. Bookshare is free. Free is a good number, right? Bring that in and, and present it to them. Headstrong, obviously, I've told you about that. National Center for Learning Disabilities, um, I think they're the best uh, scientific resource. Eye to Eye, a splendid organization for mentoring. 
and then finally Smart Kids with LD Online. It's a, a, a group in Connecticut that was essentially, it probably would be the equivalent of an early decoding dyslexia chapter. They've been around a long time, they've got a great website. So this is a brief history of where we are in the movement. Um, it's not a scientific graph because it doesn't have the axis on the left, but it is my sense of where we're headed. If you go back in time, 1954, we passed, passed our, the, the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board of Education. It said separate is not equal. It's a very important principle in US law. We then, um, in 1975, passed the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. This will become IDEA. This is the law that you have a right to trigger to get your child identified and supported. Um, then comes me, right? Here's me as a kid in 1980. I get picked up. This is the time of the Kleenex box, as I call it. Um, from there, fast forward roughly 30, 40 years to the present, and you get a new conversation that has begun. Brock and Fernet Eide, they're wonderful researchers who have written this book, which is a great resource on the science of dyslexia, as well as a different way of looking at it. And they're identifying people who have advantages that are related to dyslexia, its advantages and disadvantages. The most important thing is its context. People will say, well, this is a disability. And other people say, well, this is a gift. And you know what? They're both right. And you want to really frustrate someone who's got a very strong opinion? Tell them that they're both right. <laughs> it depends on context, right? That person in the wheelchair going up the stairs, disability. In a marathon, they will beat the winning running time by about half an hour. Context will drive that. So think about that. Now, it continues to the present. And here I am with a Portland native, uh, Asano Duncan. I'd like to just highlight, if you will, for just indulge me for one minute, Walter Duncan in the back. Just put your hand up, Walter. Walter is my dearest friend of 38 years. He's the guy I came up to see, and he is just an outstanding parent. We have not identified his kids as being dyslexic. I'm not, not sure that they will be, but they're cute beyond belief, and, um, and they're great learners. And so let's just give Walter Duncan a round of applause on my behalf. <laughs> He's also instrumental to being here because I came up here for Thanksgiving, and he can't keep his mouth shut. So he told the decoding dyslexia lady that I was coming to town. Um, so uh, we continue. Um, let me tell you then what, what the red line represents. The red line represents the number of people who are identified as dyslexic. Back in time, look at the membership for recording in the blind and dyslexic. It was recording for the blind. When an organization that's that big and that old changes its whole name, something happened. What happened was about 1975, they started getting calls from parents of kids who are dyslexic because the school had said it's dyslexia. Your kid's blind. No, they're dyslexic. Oh, well, uh, what do we do? Eventually, the parents were lying about their kid's visual acuity. The parents were like, oh, he's blind. <laughs> don't check, but he's blind. Oh, yeah, totally. And they're like, tell you what, why don't we just change our services and expand to include that population? Right? It's, it's an actual true story. Um, but then what happened was um, uh, the number of people who are identified and the number of people who are public. Right? So the green line is the number of people who are talking about this. I was identified when I was young. And I had to be public about it, right? Because you get picked up out of the mainstream classroom and walked out every time reading happens. Leaves a mark. The thing about this particular flavor of shame is that it arrives when the concrete of your child's personality is still wet. They're in first grade, second grade, and they're going through a process that psychologists call individuation. They're learning to look up to other people, to relate to other people outside their nuclear family unit. And as a result, if people throw negative messages at them when they are, say, six, seven, and eight, it sinks into that concrete and stays there. And you have to chip it out and get it out in order to heal them and make them feel whole. And that's part of what your challenge is. Now, what's happening is this. Right now, we're having a spike. Why? Because this is genetic. And what do people who are 35 and 40 have? Eight-year-olds, <laughs> right? They had kids, and the kids are getting identified. And when the kid gets identified, they ask the parent, is there a history of dyslexia here? My favorite was Charles Schwab's answer. Charles Schwab, financier, billion entrepreneur, billionaire, dyslexic. When he was asked this, <laughs> he says, well, no, no history of dyslexia. Oh, great. What do you like to read? Well, I don't read. <laughs> really? No dyslexia. Nope. Do you think you might want to get it tested? Oh, maybe. Goes and gets tested, dyslexia, right? So it's the process of the kids getting identified that's triggering the adult portion of it teaming up with the parents, we've got an opportunity for real change here. And that's where I'd leave it. 
Real change comes from small daily actions by people who go and do something meaningful. Decoding dyslexia is your local opportunity to get other parents who are aligned with you and to start moving this ball forward. Your kid eventually will become the advocate, him or herself. And eventually, Learning Ally and uh, other organizations are going to support that kid getting through school, but the kid's ultimately going to become the advocate. If you look at an organization like Eye to Eye, they do a brilliant job of training young people to be advocates. And then they will lead this, and we will lead it all together. So I'll close on this. This is about shame. It is about negative experiences. But ultimately, it's about turning that low into a high. And that high is so much higher for the low. I'll tell you this, if you play to your strengths, your children are unstoppable. So focus on that, and thank you very much for your time. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> and then you're done with school. No. Um, uh, in theory, you have identified your kids' strengths, and you begin playing to them. You should play to them all along. So in the book, I identify um, <laughs> a different way of thinking about your kids' strengths. Um, this image is, a, uh, is a, an instrument that I lay out. You figure out your kids' strengths in terms of their verbal, social, narrative, spatial, kinesthetic, uh, visual, mathematics, scientific, or musical and you pick the top three. Where are they strongest? And then you focus on that as the path in. Think about learning as a physical landscape. And if going in the eye reading path is a cold, rocky, snow-filled mountain pass, and using the ear reading path or using kinesthetic learning, right? Some of my favorite dyslexics are the people who are really physical, they bounce off the walls, they wanna go touch everything, they wanna build Legos, they love Minecraft, they're great athletes. Those folks should not be locked down in a classroom all day. Right? They should be learning through experience. Now, the school may actually require that they stay in the school, but you can start finding things that they're good at. Get them signed up for a robotics class. Right? Begin developing the area that is the best strength as a learning area. So if they're good verbally or they're good auditorily, practice and build that. My suspicion is you'll find if you put four years into training them how to use their ears to listen to something, they'll do a lot better. On the Headstrong Nation website, there are videos that explain all these different categories in the tool section. Go there and check it out. To speech, speech, speech to text, yeah? Right. Is there one that you find is easier for children to use? Or? Uh, Dragon, well, what you want is not easy, you want best. Um, because you want the highest quality. Okay. So um, the way to do that is uh, Dragon, naturally speaking, uh, it's in the book, it's on the website. So here is a video on you talk computer rights. This will explain all that to you. Watch that video. And or if you're a text favoring person, uh, learn the facts. Um, and there's, I think, I don't know if it's on this page or the next one. Somewhere in here is the, is the, uh, the way to use speech as a way to learn. So there's non-text best learning. So that's about the text speech. So check it out. It's all there. It's good. Um, it's also good on an iPhone or an Android. You can push that little microphone button and read it. Important point. In the world of speech technology, when I was at Intel, um, we did a bunch of research. It turns out there's something called the Star Trek expectation when you interact with speech software. Okay? What this means is you're going to say, computer, put it into warp drive, get me a cup of coffee, and call Lieutenant Sulu. Right? It's not going to happen. Right? It's going to take some practice and some time. And so your child may get frustrated with it, but show them the upside. Example, would you like to have three hours of homework or one hour of homework? Well, if we go with this one, less homework. I know all of you fight the homework battle with your kid. More time, more energy. But if you're putting them in front of stairs and your kid's resisting you, that kid's right. That's a smart kid who's like, this is stupid. They might be right. <laughs> as long as it's not shame driving it and it's actual concrete reality, shift to that direction. So that, that's where I would go to look for technology. It's the website and it's also, there's a whole chapter in the book on it. So yes, over here. Let's actually say on this side one more and then we'll come around because then we can do a, we're flow mapping here. Yes, question with the microphone. Yeah. But there aren't tools yet um, that can't be directly used with kids. So what you're saying is you want a book that, a, yeah. a new book. Okay. Um, um, I'll get right on it. Get on it. <laughs> I need it like now. In all seriousness, uh, I, actually, I actually have a, I have a treatment already and I'm thinking about it. Um, so, and it, it would be fiction.
because you don't want to you don't want to go nonfiction. You want to just you want to put it inside of candy, right? You want to put the medicine inside the candy, right? And the medicine here is identifying and dealing with shame. But it's got to be something you want because if you go at someone who feels shame with this will help you not feel shame. You know what they say? Shame? I don't know. What me? I don't want to make rockets. You have to give it in a form that they can actually digest. So your child, I'm guessing, doesn't feel as much shame. Is they, are they one of the people well, up here? What's that? I'm a practitioner, so I work with okay. lots of different kids. If you go at them with, hey, this book will help you deal with the shame associated with your <laughs> learning profile, <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but if, if it's fun, if it's fun, if it's fun, then yeah. this will be a great way to do it. Yeah. So I think that's a great idea. Is that just something underlying that she's not, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. I'll tell you more generally what I know from the patterns. Okay. Um, if, a, if a child is comfortable being identified over this issue and easy about it, if it doesn't strike fear in them to discuss it, um, that's a really good sign. Um, it is also possible that they have, um, so, so again, this is now the Gershon Kaufman. Gershon Kaufman, who is a brilliant scientist, when he identified, um, he, in, in one of his books, he talks about the level of shame. So they, they, in psychology, they actually have sort of like, it's like a Richter scale for shame, right? The level of shame that you're feeling around something. Um, in the context of dyslexia, he said that adults who have, in his phrase was, the disability related to not being able to read, because this was in the, in the 80s when he wrote this, the level of shame that they experienced, his words, not mine, are equivalent to the level of shame experienced by people who went through incest. Yeah. I have a hard time coming up with a more shame-ridden category. It's really deep in there, and it has to do with when they were individuating, you hit them with this really negative thing, right? If, I, I have a friend who's in a wheelchair. Uh, Pete Denman, he's one of the, the Headstrong Nation fellows. When he came to me in a wheelchair, quadriplegic at, 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 at Intel, and said, I have something to tell you, I'm dyslexic, but don't tell anybody. And I'm like, Pete, they know you have a disability. <laughs> You're in a wheelchair. And he's like, he's like, yeah, 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 but I failed third grade, and I don't want anyone to know that. He'd been in a, in a school that had, had just punished him, because he'd grown up in a small town, and everyone for the rest of his life had known Pete, the guy who failed third grade. Like, that was his shorthand, right? Now he's a designer at Intel. You know what I said to Pete? I mean, after we kind of got to know each other and built some rapport, eventually, I said to him, Pete, no one cares. <laughs> no one cares that you failed third grade. You know who cares? You do. So what you need to do is take third grade out back, dig a hole, put third grade in it, put some dirt on it, get some flowers, have a ceremony, and let it go. Right? He now gives, he gave us a talk at the um, Oregon chapter of the International Dyslexia Association three years ago called um, How Quadriplegia Cured My Dyslexia. <laughs> Here's why. It's a really interesting fact. So he didn't have a spinal cord injury when he was uh, 20 or in third grade. It's fine. But then he snapped his neck swimming one day. He had gone to one semester of community college and failed out because he'd never gotten proper accommodations. So what's the first thing they do after rehab? Talking computer books on tape. So he used the secret accommodation of his wheelchair to get him access to what he needed for his non-obvious disability. He went on to get, become a designer at Intel, right? So he built this elaborate story about his wheelchair being his only disability. But in fact, the deeper, more painful one was the dyslexia. So the thing about shame is that it metastasizes. If you feel shame over dyslexia when you're young, it can start showing up in other places in your psyche. So it can be, I'm no good, at, I'm, no one wants to talk to me. I'm not a good athlete. You know, I'm not, I'm not pretty. I'm not smart, in some other area of their life. I hope your child is shame-free. No child is shame-free. I'm not shame-free, right? There's all, it's all degrees, right? And I would say build on that and run with it. How old is your kid? Nine. Nine, okay. Something's gonna happen, which is when uh, he or she? She. Turns like 13, 14. They're not gonna wanna talk to you anymore. Okay, and so you wanna arm them with as much of this as possible, and a great way to do it is get them involved in mentoring other people. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that torture to learn the skill set of typing? You know, every person's individual. Have you looked at an iPad recently? Do you see a keypad? Yeah, there's a keypad. So, I mean, mm. so, there's other ways to, to input data. Just talk to it. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I'm being I'm being glib. Let me let me answer your question. The answer is um, you should figure out how much pain it is for your kid to learn this skill, right? Going upstairs is a great skill. Typing is a great skill. Typing really fast is a great skill. It's an ironic twist that in our culture we teach typing to girls because it used to be a secretary task when in fact big managers at corporations, what we should actually do is teach every kid how to type on a Blackberry at like nine, right? And then they'll be really important, right? Um, you, should, you should spend some time on it. I think it sounds like you've done a year of trying to teach them how to type well. Is the learning curve leveling off? Then don't do it. Okay. Yeah. And then reading. Yes. Eye reading. I have him do eye reading. Good. Um, I mean, he listens to books on tape. Good. Awesome. Do that. But I still say, okay, you know, and I have to force him if I, if I just. Stop if forcing I him. If, if I how, how old's your kid? He's 10. If I, so I require him to do 25 minutes of reading a day. If he doesn't read it out loud, he mm -mm. has no idea what he just read. Nope. Back up. Nope. Yeah. Let I, it go. Do I just chuck that? Yeah. <laughs> let me give you let me give you a metaphor. So have you done have you has he had an opportunity to have Orton Gillingham interventions? Um, we are just starting that now. Then that is worth doing. And I I, I, I I spoke a little too fast. It is worth spending two years more on that with a proper Orton Gillingham trained tutor or educational environment. That's important. If you can do that, because you do want to increase his his facility with this as much as possible. While doing that, you should value the audio learning he's doing. Very important. If tomorrow, God forbid, I got stabbed in the eyes and couldn't read with my eyes anymore, first off, I'd be a blind dyslexic. Everyone's like, is that possible? I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> Second, would you feel I should spend 25 minutes a day focusing on learning how to read with my eyes? No. no. It, my mom and I had a long conversation about this issue over many years, and eventually the thing that really landed for her is I said, Mom, imagine that I'm blind when it comes to text. The original words for dyslexia were word blindness. And I think, with respect, you might want to look at your own need to have your child read with his eyes. What does that mean for you? It means, probably, access to learning, independence. What it means to him is, torture, and frustration. Is there something that you're not good at? Taxes. OK, so 25 minutes a day of taxes. <laughs> OK? <laughs> now, shouldn't we all learn how to do our taxes? No. Oh, you hire an accountant. You have to handle it. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, OK. Apply it at home. OK. Yeah. So the question is twofold. Yeah. Is Intel creating an application that where you can take a picture and, and have it read and read well? Uh -huh. Or if not, what would you recommend? So it's in the book, um, and it's in it's on the website, um, headstrongnation.org, or in the book, The Dyslexia Empowerment Plan. Um, the answer is Intel did create that. It's still shipping. It's called the Intel Reader. So mm -hmm. that exists. However, um, eventually that will leave the market because all technology moves on. Um, I know that they have licensed it to a startup to try and do it. There's no one size fits all. And what you want to do is experiment with stuff. Um, the key to prototyping is to fail fast. If it's not going to work, figure that out as soon as possible. And when we, I was building the Intel Reader, do you know what our first prototype was? I was shopping this PowerPoint around, and I was having a hard time getting anyone to pay attention to it. And then I met this guy, and I said, he'd built a very successful product in Metal Group. And he said, what do you need? I said, get a prototype, any prototype, physical object. So I went down to my basement. I pulled out a styrofoam cooler, took an X-Acto knife, and I cut out a block of styrofoam. I went upstairs, took an X-Acto knife, and carved it up a little more. And then I wrote on it with a pen. I put a camera on it and some buttons, brought in the meeting with my boss. I said, I've got prototype 1.0 right here. Slid across the table to him, looks at it. Buttons are too small. <laughs> How much would it cost to make them bigger? Well, I gave him a number. Made it up on the spot. He gave me the number, right? Because I'd engaged him in the reality of the thing. So for your child, experiment. Try out all seven of them. They, most of these online ones have free trials. Try the trial out, right? Also, look at the videos on the Headstrong Nation website, so you, you'll get that information. So thank you very much, folks.